Good day everyone and welcome to our parasitology class discussion. This discussion is brought to you by the Cagayan State University College of Medicine, Batch Marie Lab 2023. For today, we will be having an introductory discussion about protozoa and sarcodina, medically significant entamoeba, and dolimax, iodamoeba, and diantamoeba species. Like what you're hearing and watching? Subscribe to this channel for more medical discussions. Thank you, and have a good time learning with us. Add it to cart. No. Add it to cart. No. Ano nga sa'yo? This is Limin Hawks. And today, we will be discussing all about the group Protozoa. So before we proceed, first, let us meet the members of the group. Abdullah, Anzia, Bakud, Banataw, Bangayan, Balido, Kaloy, Columna, Combate, Dulin, Dumelod, Fernando, Ferrer, Gonzales, Gumpad, Gunay, Hipolito, Hugilon, Lasam, Palatao, Pasinos, Tabago, and Tumamang. For our past lectures on microbiology, we have delved into the world of prokaryotes, specifically that of bacteria. In this particular lecture, we will now proceed to another domain classification, the eukaryotes. For this lecture, we will discuss all about the group protozoa and some of its representative genera. For the outline of today's lecture, first, let us acquaint ourselves with the group protozoa. Are you serious? This is torture. You're torturing me and everyone else watching. Wait. By pointing out some important details, such as the generalities of organisms under this classification. Next, we will proceed to the specific genera under this classification, specifically Sarcodina, Entamoeba, Endolimax, Iodamoeba, and Diantamoeba. But as well as are eukaryotic unicellular microorganisms, which together with single-cell algae and slime molds belong to the kingdom Protista. They possess simpler and more primitive structures than the members of the animal kingdom. It is also important to note that most protozoans are microscopic. They contain membrane surrounded nucleus as well as other membrane bound organelles. Most protozoans have, at least in some stage of their life, structures such as flagella or cilia that enable them to move and for some other species, acquire nutrients. To understand better the representative genera under this group, it is imperative that we first describe protozoans in general. So what is the group protozoa? Protozoa is a group of single-celled eukaryotic microorganisms. Take note, single-celled and eukaryotic proto-animals. The term protozoa means protos or first, and zoon meaning animal. In a complete sense, it means the first animals. Much like other successful organisms, protozoans are adapted to different situations. For instance, a certain parasitic protozoan may have evolved to tailor fit its life cycle to that of its host. Out of the 10,000 species of parasitic protozoa present, only about 70 species are present in man. For the general features of protozoa, as mentioned, protozoans are primarily single cell, which means a single protozoal cell must perform all biological functions much like that in bacteria. Most of the protozoa are completely non-pathogenic. However, some may cause major diseases such as malaria, leishmaniasis, and sleeping sickness. Protozoa like Cryptosporidium parvum and Toxoplasma gondii, on the other hand, are being recognized as opportunistic pathogens in patients affected with human immunodeficiency virus or HIV and in those undergoing immunosuppressive therapy. This means that these organisms only cause diseases in immunocompromised individuals. Protozoans may exhibit sizes varying from 1 micrometer to 150 micrometer 
There is also variation in shape and structure among protozoans, yet all possess essentially common features which will be tackled later. Parasitic infections are either due to metazoans. Generally, protozoan parasites are provided with nucleus or nuclei, cytoplasm, outer limiting membrane, and membrane-bound organelles. Among these also are locomotory apparatus, which includes cilia, flagella, and pseudopodia. There is also an increasing knowledge about the presence of what we call an apical complex found in some members of this group, which aids the organism in, penetration, in penetrating target cells. Water is an essential component of the life cycle of protozoans. A wet environment would aid in feeding, locomotion, osmoregulation, and in reproduction. Protozoans also form what we call infective, what we call cysts, which are their infective stages. These cysts are relatively resistant to environmental changes compared to the vegetative to its vegetative stage, which we refer to as the trophozoites. Parasitic species are capable of multiplying within the host and may be transmitted through a biological vector within which they can also multiply. Another group of eukaryotes comparable to protozoans are the metazoans or the multicellular animals. Let us first differentiate these two groups to better highlight special characteristics of protozoans. For morphology, protozoans, as I've mentioned earlier, are unicellular. Therefore, a single cell must assume all biological functions in order to maintain the individual. Whereas, in, in contrast, metazoans, which are multicellular, are, consists of a number of cells that makes up the complex individual. For the physiology, protozoans consist of a single cell that performs all the functions, including reproduction, digestion, respiration, excretion, etc. Whereas for metazoans, which are multicellular, each special cell performs a particular function. An example of a protozoan are the amoebas. In particular, we have amoeba proteus, and for metazoans, we have the tapeworms, and in particular, we have tenia solium or the pork tapeworm. For the structure of protozoans, the typical protozoan cell is bounded by a trilaminar unit membrane supported by a sheath of contractile fibrils enabling the cells to move and change in shape. The cytoplasm of a protozoan consists of two distinct portions, the ectoplasm and the endoplasm. The ectoplasm refers to the outer homogeneous part that serves as the organ for locomotion and also functions in engulfment of food by producing pseudopodia. It also helps in respiration, in excretion or in discharging waste material, materials, and in providing a protective covering for the cell. The endoplasm, on the other hand, refers to the inner granular portion of cytoplasm that contains the nucleus. A number of structures, a number of structures can be found in the endoplasm, which includes Golgi bodies, endoplasmic reticulum, food vacuoles, and contractile vacuoles as well. Contractile vacuoles serve to regulate osmotic pressure in the, in the organism. Another special characteristic of Protozoans, which differentiate different other microbial organisms such as bacteria, is the presence of a true nucleus. The nucleus of protozoans are usually single, but may be double or multiple. Some species may have as many as 100 nuclei in a single cell. The nucleus contains one or more nucleoli, or what we call the central chromosome. The chromatin may also be distributed along the periphery, which we will refer to as peripheral chromatin or may be present as a condensed mass around the chromosome. For reproduction, reproduction among protozoans may be through asexual and sexual means, although asexual reproduction predominates in this group. In ciliates and sporozoans, however, sexual reproduction may also occur. Here are some of the mechanisms by which protozoans asexually reproduce. First, we have binary fission. To put it simply, binary fission is the splitting of a single cell into a pair of daughter cells. Binary fission may occur in the longitudinal plane or in the transverse plane. 
Longitudinal bi- binary fission is common amongst flagellates, whereas transverse binary fission is common among ciliates. Another type of asexual reproduction common in protozoans is multiple fission or what we refer to as schizogony. In schizogony, the single plasmodium cell broadly divides into several cells inside the host's red blood cells, after which the cells or the merozoites are then released in the circulation. As have been implicated in the figure just discussed, binary fission is a method of asexual reproduction by which a single parasite divides either longitudinally or transversally into two or more equal number of parasites or what we refer to as daughter cells. Mitotic division of nucleus is followed by the division of cytoplasm. In amoebae, division occurs along any plane. But in flagellates, division al- is along the longitudinal, longitudinal axis, whereas for the ciliates, division is along the transverse plane. Multiple fission or schizogony. Spodium or species under the genus undergo several successive divisions within the schizoid to produce large number of what we, what we refer to as merozoids. Endodiogeny is also apparent in some protozoans. Toxoplasma, in particular, multiply through endodiogeny by budding internally, resulting in the formation of a pair of daughter cells within the mother cell. In terms of sexual reproduction, protozoans may undergo what we call conjugal conjugation, wherein two organisms join together and reciprocally exchange nuclear materials. This is common in ciliates such as Balantidium coli. Another means of sexual reproduction in protozoans is through what we call gametogony or syngamy. In sporozoa, male and female gametocytes are produced, which after fertilization forms what we call the zygote, which then gives rise to numerous sporozoids by sporogony, and this is apparent in certain species of plasmodium. For the life cycle of protozoans, some protozoans complete their life cycle in a single host. Others, such as plasmodium, on the other hand, may require a second host in which a sexual reproduction occurs in the host, man in the case of plasmodium, and sexual reproduction in another host, mosquito or the vector in this case, or in the case of plasmodium. The figure to the left just shows a particular protozoan having only a single host. For the classification of protozoa, protozoan parasites of medical importance have been classified into kingdom protista, subkingdom protozoa, which is then further divided into the following four phyla. We have phylum sarcoma sigophora, phylum apicomplexa, phylum microspora, and phylum ciliospora, ciliophora. The table to your left shows the representative species under each phylum. For phylum sarcoma sigophora, we have acanthamoeba, endolimax, entamoeba, iodamoeba, and negleria. For phylum sigophora or the atrial flagellates, we have phylomastix, the entamoeba, gargia, gar- gargia, trichomonas, and for Hemophagulates, a subgroup under my Masigophora, we have Leishmania and Trypanosoma. For Ciliophora, we have Balantidium. For Apicomtesa, we have Babesia, Cryptosporidium, Cytoisospora, Plasmodium, and Toxoplasma. Lastly, for Microspora, we have Enterocytozoon, Encephalitozoon, Vita Forma, Trachyplastophoria, Leistophora, An- Anca- Anca- Ancalia, and Microsporidium. For this particular discussion, we will only delve into the, in, into the phylum Sarcoma sigophora and the si- subphylum Sarcodina in particular. So here are some protozoan pathogens of man. We have Entamoeba histolytica, Negleria fowleri, Acanthamoeba, Giardia, Giardia, Trichomonas vaginalis, Trypanosoma, Leishmania, Plasmodium, Babesia, Isospora, Cryptosporidium, and Balantidium coli. Highlighted here also are the habitat 
and the specific diseases that these per- 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 particular protozoans cause. For phylum sarcoma masigophora, phylum sarcoma masigophora has been subdivided into two subphyla based on their modes of lo- locomotion. Based on the name, these are the sarcodinas and the masigophorans. For sarcodina, sarcos meaning flesh or body. It includes those parasites which have no permanent locomotory organs but move about with the but move about with the aid of a hyaline foot-like foot-like extrusion from the ectoplasm, which we refer to as the pseudopodia or the false feet. Subphylum sarcodina includes the amoebae, namely entamoeba, endolimax, iodamoeba, acantamoeba, and nigleria. For mastigophora, mastix meaning whip or flagellum. It includes those protozoans which possess whip-like flagella. Subphylum mastigophora includes the atrial flagellates and hemoflagellates, namely Gardia, Kilomastix, Trichomonas, Dientamoeba, Trypanosoma, and Leishmania. For phylum apicomplexa, phylum apicomplexa have an apical complex, thus the name, at the anterior end, which consists of polar rings, subpellicular tubules, conoid processes, rock trees, and micronemes. These structures are involved in penetrating and invading target cells. <clears throat> All members of the phylum apicomplexa are parasitic, and very important groups of, the, of parasites fall under the class Sporozoa under apicomplexa, namely plas, Plasmodium, Babesia, Toxoplasma, Cytoisospora, Cryptosporidium, and Cyclospora. These organisms have been reported practically from all organ systems of both animals and humans, specifically in the gastrointestinal tract or the GI tract, the genitourinary tract, central nervous system, even respiratory tract, reticuloendothelial system, the blood and blood cells, eyes, skin, and even the oral cavity. For phylum microspora, phylum microspora includes an enterocytozoans and encephalitozoans. Phylum microspora consists of spore-forming parasites of both vertebrates and invertebrates. Though the phylum contains more than 100 genera, the members are similar in that they possess a unique extrusion apparatus which enables them to insert infective material into the host cell. The apparatus includes a highly coiled polar filament which due to varying stimuli from the gastrointestinal tract, extrudes forming a polar tube that in turn penetrates into the host cell. These parasites have received more attention recently due to the increasing number of opportunistic infections associated with immunocompromised states, particularly in AIDS. For phylum ciliophora, Phylum ciliophora, whose species have organelles of locomotion that are hair-like projections, or cilia, does the name ciliophora, which includes only one parasite of medical and public health interest, which is Balantidium coli. Lastly, we have Sarcodina. Sarcodina are the amoebas and their relatives. Amoebas consist of a single cell without a definite shape, whose organelles of locomotion are hyal- hyaline foot-like extrusion- extrusions from the ectoplasm, which we refer to as pseudopodia or the false feet. They feed on small organisms and particle- particles of organic matter, and they engulf the particles by the process which we refer to as phagocytosis or self-feeding. Found in most lakes, ponds, and other bodies of what? fresh water, they move by a creeping form of locomotion called amoeboid motion. Sarcodines, or the member of the phylum sarcodina, may reproduce asexually by cell division, often without breakdown of the nuclear envelope that is typical in mitosis, or sexually by meiosis and the production of haploid gametes, followed by fusion of these gametes and formation of the zygote. One amoeba called Entamoeba histolytica causes a type of dysentery in humans. Under Sarcodina, we also have the following Acantamoeba castellani, Endolimax nana, Entamoeba coli, Entamoeba dispar, Entamoeba gingivalis, Entamoeba histolytica, Iodamoeba butchii, and lastly, Negleria falderi, 
some of which will be discussed in the latter portions of this lecture. Happy anniversary. Okay lang yan. Basta my smart giga. Okay video every day. Okay lang yan. <laughs> Your okay life may better with smart giga K video every day. How can you be sure? Simple. Smart ako. Entamibay solitica is one of the most clinically significant parasitic protozoans. It infects up to 10% of the world's population, resulting in morbidity and mortality second only to that of malaria and schizosomiasis. It causes amoebiasis, which predisposes individuals to certain complications such as amoebic ulcerative colitis and amoebic liver abscesses. Ingestion of entamibay solitica usually is a result of fecal contaminated food, water, and hands. For the taxonomic classification of Entamoeba histolytica, Entamoeba, as previously discussed, belong to the domain Eukarya, Phylum Sarcoma Sigophora. It is a sarcodine, thus it belongs to subphylum Sarcodina. Under this, we have the superclass Rhizopodia, class Lobacera, order Amoebida, family Entamoebida, genus Entamoeba, and species histolytica. As have been previously discussed, sarcodines such as Entamoeba histolytica possesses what we call a pseudopod or the hyaline foot-like extrusions coming from the ectoplasm. Entamoeba histolytica is the most invasive species in the entamoeba family and possibly the only member of the family to cause gastrointestinal diseases as well as contribute to the pathogenesis of colitis and even liver abscesses. On cellular features, entamoeba histolytica lack organelles that resemble mitochondria. Similarly, it doesn't possess any endoplasmic reticulum as well as Golgi apparatus, although its cell surface and secreted proteins contain signal sequences. The figure to your right shows an entamoeba histolytica in cis form, where in the presence of several nuclei containing a central chorosome is apparent. We now proceed to biochemical characteristics of entamoeba histolytica. Entamoeba histolytica lack glutathione metabolism. It uses pyrophosphate instead of ATP at several steps in glycolysis. It is also unable to synthesize plurinucleotides de novo, possibly owing to the lack of certain membrane-bound organelles. Glucose is actively transported in the cytoplasm, and the end products of its metabolism are ethanol and carbon dioxide, whereas acetate is produced in aerobic conditions. Let's now proceed to the life cycle of endamoeba histolytica. The life cycle of entamoeba histolytica is relatively simple, wherein no intermediate hosts are involved. Humans are the only known hosts to entamoeba histolytica. Entamoeba histolytica, or its trophozoite form specifically, infect target cells extracellularly and do not undergo antigenic variation. To reiterate, entamoeba histolytica has two stages in its life cycle, primarily an infective C stage and an invasive trophozoite stage. First, let's discuss the infective cyst stage. The cyst contains four nuclei or are quadrinucleate as can be seen in the figure. It is resistant to extreme conditions such as desiccation and gastric acidity. Infection occurs only when the cysts are ingested from fecally contaminated material as indicated in the number two of its life cycle diagram. In the life cycle of entamoeba histolytica, it is important to take note that the cysts are the infective stage, whereas both the cysts and the trophozoite stages hold importance in diagnosis. Modes of transmission include fecal route or through direct inoculation in the colon through contaminated enema equipment. In the small and large bowel, existation occurs as highlighted in the number two of the diagram producing trophozoites either to nuclear fission and cytoplasmic division, in which eight trophozoites are formed. We now move on to the trophozoite. The trophozoite form of entamoeba histolytica is, is its invasive form, as have been mentioned, due to its highly motile nature owing to the presence of pseudopodia. Trophozoites multiply through binary fission, producing daughter cells which may undergo encystment, in turn producing uninucleate cysts. 
the uninucleate cysts undergo two successive nuclear divisions, thus forming the characteristic quadrinucleate cysts of Entamoeba histolytica. We now proceed to the pathogenesis and clinical manifestations of Entamoeba histolytica infection. Most cases present as asymptomatic infections with cysts being passed out in the stool. If this is the case, the person is said to be in cyst carrier state. The non-pathogenic entamoeba dispar has a higher prevalence than entamoeba histolytica. Most entamoeba histolytica infections are asymptomatic in endemic communities. Trophozoites primarily invade intestinal mucosa. As a consequence, amoebic colitis may ensue. Symptoms of amoebic colitis include a gradual onset of abdominal pain and diarrhea with or without blood and mucus in the stool. Fever may also be present in one-third of patients with the infection. In some cases, there may also be intermittent diarrhea alternating with constipation. Upon histologic examination, a flask-shaped colon ulcer may be observed, as can be seen in the figure to the right. Children may develop fulminant colitis, characterized by the presence of severe bloody diarrhea, fever, and abdominal pain. Amoeboma is a rare complication of amoebic colitis. This condition occurs in less than 1% of intestinal infections caused by entamoeba histolytica. Upon inspection, a mass-like lesion may be present with accompanying abdominal pain and a history of dysentery. Histologic examination of the mass-like lesions may be mistaken for carcinoma. The image to the right is the one being referred to as the mass-like lesions. Trophozoites of entamoeba histolytica may also invade other organs apart from the intestines. Amoebic liver abscesses or ALA is the most common extraintestinal form of amoebiasis. Cardinal manifestations are the most frequent complaints in acute cases accompanied by fever and right upper quadrant pain. Upon palpation, liver may be tender. In 50% of cases, hepatomegaly may be present. And upon biopsy, an anchovy paste like aspirate may be acquired. In chronic disease, or those lasting more than two weeks, there may be associated wasting and may be apparent in older individuals. 72% of daily stool cultures harbor trophozoites even in asymptomatic infection. Mortality is relatively low in uncomplicated cases. Okay, so we now proceed to the diagnosis of entamoeba histolytica infections. Microscopy serves as the standard method of diagnosis of both the trophozoid and C stages of entamoeba histolytica in stool specimen. For detection of trophozoids, fresh stool samples must be examined within 30 minutes from defecation. Use of direct fecal smear with saline solution serves in observation of trophozoid motility wherein unidirectional movement is characteristic of the trophozoid. The use of saline and methylene blue, on the other hand, serves to differentiate entamoeba, which will stain blue from that of white blood cells. The figure on top shows the cyst form, whereas that on the bottom shows the trophozoid form. The characteristic nuclei containing central carosome can be observed in the image of entamoeba histolytica cyst, as for the trophozoid, a single nucleus containing a central carosome can be observed. The outlying more amorph amorphous portion is the ectoplasm, whereas the inner and denser and more granulated portion is the endoplasm. Apparent also in the image are ingested red blood cells. Still on microscopy, the use of saline and iodine permits observation of nucleus and carosome, which may facilitate differentiation of entamoeba histolytica from non-pathogenic entamoebas such as entamoeba coli as well as from endolime maxnana. Detection of ent entamoeba histolytica trophozoid with ingested RBCs is diagnos diagnostic of the presence of amoebiasis. Charcot-laden crystals can also be seen in stool. Concentration methods such as FECT or formalin ether concentration test and MIFC or methylate iodine formalin concentration test are more sensitive than DFS or the direct fecal smear for the detection of cysts. Morphologic structures observed are the size of cysts, 
the number of nuclei, loco location and appearance of chromosome, appearance of chromatoid bodies, presence of cytoplasmic structures such as glycogen back to O, species identification of entamoeba histolytica, and entamoeba dispar is not possible for microscopy. Instead, PCR, ELISA, and isoenzyme analysis are performed instead. Serology is another technique utilized in diagnosis of entamoeba histolytica infection. Detection of serine-rich entamoeba histolytica protein or SREHP antibodies in the serum is a key diagnostic technique in identifying for the presence of amoebic liver abscesses or ALA. In ALA, microscopic detection cannot be done because aspiration is an invasive procedure and trophozoids are missed because they are found at the periphery of the abscesses. Some of the serological tests commonly utilized in the diagnosis of entamoeba histolytica infection are the following. We have indirect heme agglutination or IHAE, counter immunoelectrophoresis or CIE, agar gel diffusion or AGD, indirect fluorescent antibody test or IFAT, and lastly, ELISA or the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. IHAE can detect antibodies of past infection even after some time or even as long as 10 years. Still on serology, since antibodies are, are demonstrated even in asymptomatic, asymptomatic infections, serology can still be used to monitor cyst carriers. The third diagnostic procedure is radiography. This involves the use of ultrasound, CT scan, and MRI, which are non-invasive and yet sensitive enough to be used for the early detection of amoebic liver abscesses. We now move on to the treatment and prognosis of entamoeba histolytica infections. There are two primary objectives in the treatment of entamoeba histolytica infections. One is to cure invasive disease at both intestinal and extra-intestinal sites. Next is to eliminate the passage of cysts from the intestinal lumen. The typical dosing for treatment with metronidazole is 500 to 700 milligrams orally administered three times a day for 7 to 10 days. Whereas for the pediatric groups, the dosing is 35 to 50 milligrams per kilogram per day in three divided doses. Tinidazole and secnidazole are also effective pharmacological interventions. For asymptomatic cyst passer, Diloxanide furoate is the drug of choice. Luminal agents include paromycin, diiodohydroxyquin, and diloxanide furoate in the following doses. Percutaneous, of, per, percutaneous drainage of liver abscesses is only performed for patients who do not respond to metronidazole, for prompt symptomatic relief of severe pain, and for patients with left lobe abscesses that may rupture into the pericardium or those with large and multiple abscesses with, the da with danger of rupturing. Now proceed to the epidemiology of entamoeba histolytica infections. Entamoeba histolytica continues to be an important global health issue, being the third leading cause of death from parasitic infections. Although 90% of histolytica infections are asymptomatic, nearly 50 million people become symptomatic with up to 100,000 deaths yearly. Those infected by entamoeba are mostly colonized by either entamoeba histolytica or entamoeba dispar. Entamoeba histolytica is a pathogenic form and can cause amoebic colitis as well as extra-intestinal amoebiasis, whereas entamoeba dispar, on the other hand, is considered to be non-pathogenic and causes no signs of disease. Infections occur worldwide with a higher prevalence in countries of low socioeconomic status and poor public health. Countries with a higher rate of infection include India, Africa, Mexico, Central and South America. In rural areas of Mexico, the seroprevalence of entamoeba histolytica has been reported to be as high as 42%. Risk factors for infections are mostly related to fecal oral, oral transmission and have been due to poor hand hygiene, defecation into water sources such as rivers, and being in close proximity with animals. In developed countries such as the United States, amoebiasis infections are rare, accounting for only at least five deaths per year and are commonly seen only in individuals that have had exposure to endemic areas such as immigrants or recent travelers. Amoebic colitis generally affects males and females of all ages equally. 
there are reports of increased risk of infections from gay or bisexual males due to the risk of fecal oral contamination through oral and anal sex. Factors that associate that are associated with increased risk for complica complicated infection and mortality are associated with the following. We have pregnancy, corticosteroid treatment, malignancy, malnutrition, and even alcoholism. Amoebic liver abscess infections are at least three times more likely to affect middle-aged men between the ages of 18 and 50. For the prevention and control of entamoeba isolitica infections, in prevention and control of entamoeba isolitica infections among the community, improvement in environment sanitation through sanitary disposal of human feces is called for. Consumption of safe drinking water and food also prevents outbreak of entamoeba isolitica infections. Eating raw fruits and vegetables cleaned with contaminated tap water may result in infection with entamoeba isolitica. Only eat well-cooked food when traveling. Proper hand hygiene should also be observed. Lastly, vaccines are cost-effective and a potent strategy in preventing infection with entamoeba isolitica. After Entamoeba histolytica, we now go to a very similar species, your Entamoeba dispar. Your Entamoeba dispar causes your human amoebiasis along with your E. histolytica. These two species are so similar morphologically that the only way to differentiate them is through their DNA and ribosomal RNA. Your Entamoeba dispar is characteristically asymptomatic and non-invasive. Hence, it's not associated with any pathological changes in the colon. But this species is responsible for majority of intestinal uh, infections caused by your entamoeba. Like your typical intestinal amoeba, E. dispar has a two-stage life cycle, the infective stage, which is the cyst, and the trophozoite stage, which adheres to the colonic mucosa. And it's also transmitted to the consumption of food or water contaminated with the infective stage or through the fecal oral route. So the entamoeba dispar was originally proposed by Emil Brumt in 1925 when e. histolytica was still considered to be a single species, when in fact, it's a species complex in which your e. histolytica is the invasive species, and e. dispar together with your e. Moshkovsky are the morphologically identical but non-invasive ones. Hence the name e. dispar, dispar meaning different. Your e. dispar seems capable of causing your focal intestinal lesions when tested on animals. However, it does not cause any symptomatic disease, nor does it elicit production of any antibodies. Your E-dispar is approximately nine times more prevalent than your E-histolytica, and together, they infect about 10% of the world's population. The high prevalence of E-dispar compared to your E-histolytica can be confirmed through your PCR. So this is the life cycle of entamoeba dispar. As you can see, this is just the same life cycle as that of the previously discussed organism, which is your entamoeba histolytica. For the epidemiology, um, in developing countries, the prevalence depends on the level of sanitation, crowding, socioeconomic status, cultural habits, and age. While for developed countries, infection is usually caused by your e-dispar and is prevalent in certain groups like your immigrants, travelers from endemic countries, homosexual males, and institutionalized people. The latter two species, which are both commensals, meaning your e-dispar and your e-moshkovsky, are 10 times more prevalent than your e-histolytica. A stool survey done in Iran with a sample population of 16,592 showed 226 positive samples. Only 101 isolates were successfully cultured in Robinson's medium. Of these isolates, 92.1% were E. dispar and only 7.9% were E. histolytica or mixed infections by PCR RFLP. A field study in northern Philippines with a sample population of 1,872 showed 7.3% e-dispar and 0.96% e-histolytica by PCR. A study in a mental institution with a sample population of 113 showed e-histolytica or e-dispar in 38.1%, while PCR detected 65.5% e-histolytica positive samples and 5.3% e-dispar e-histolytica mixed samples. So there are three methods of identification of entamoeba dispar. First, we have the wet mouth preparation. So the wet mouth preparation, since entamoeba histolytica and dispar are morphologically similar, you can distinguish the two through routine microscopy alone without the use of 
uh, any immunoassay procedures. So the organism must be reported as entamoeba histolytica slash entamoeba dispar. So the two pictures here on the left are stained using a methylene blue and saline, while the two pictures on the right are stained uh, through your iodine. Uh, the picture on the left shows your e histolytica e dispar cyst with uh, three visible nuclei. The next picture is an e histolytica e dispar cyst with one visible nucleus and a glycogen vacuole. The next picture is an e histolytica e dispar cyst in iodine with one visible nucleus and a glycogen vacuole. And the last picture is an e histolytica e dispar cyst in iodine with two visible nuclei and a chromatoid body. So this is a trichrome stained smear. On the left, we have the trophozoid, one nucleus with a centrally located carisome. And the picture on the right is your cyst form, which shows uh, one visible nuclei and a rod-like or bar-like chromatoid body. So rapid immunochromatographic cartridge assay is a rapid cartridge available that detects the antigens of your e histolytica e dispar but does not distinguish between the two. The stool samples must be fresh or frozen and not be concentrated prior to testing. Borderline positives and questionable negatives obtained with this technique should be confirmed uh, by additional testing. Uh, one advantage is that it's quick and easy to perform and that no special equipment is needed. So the reliable detection procedures for antamoeba antigens and antibodies are also commercially available. Molecular studies have been flourishing in the past decades. Attempt on genetic encoding have identified techniques that will differentiate various parasitic species. The detection rates and specificity have been greatly improved by your PCR assays. In one study in Iran by Nahafi 2019, PCR has 99% to 100% specificity in targeting the specific gene among stool samples. They concluded the reliability of the technique in early detection of asymptomatic and symptomatic cases of amoebiasis. So for antamoeba dispar, no treatment is necessary because uh, these amoeba do not cause uh, any disease. Um, contraction of the organism may be prevented through, of course, proper disposal of human waste and uh, your good personal hygiene. So now we move on to another commensal protozoa, the entamoeba coli. So what is the significance of finding these commensal parasites in your stool? Well, for one, they may be mistaken for your e histolytica, particularly your entamoeba coli, and also they are an indicator of a fecally contaminated source of food or water. So let's start. Now, the entamoeba coli is a non-pathogenic protozoa found in humans. It's a parasite of the large intestinal tract with a frequency of up to 10 to 30 percent in the population. Transmission is also to your fecal oral route, mature cysts found in contaminated water or food uh, when ingested. The infective stage is also mature cysts and they are identified through diagnostic stool specimens. So for the morphologic structures, your entamoeba coli trophozoid is usually 20 to 25 micrometer in size. Um, it has a nucleus, slow movement, short and blunt pseudopodium, and the nucleus has irregular cluster of peripheral chromatin, large irregular and eccentric chariosome. While for the cyst, it's 15 to 25 micrometer in diameter. The mature cyst has eight nuclei, rarely 16 or more, and they have a typical nuclear structure. While for the chromatoidal body, they are usually sliver shape or irregular shape or splinter like shape. So this is the life cycle of your entamoeba coli, along with the other non-pathogenic intestinal amoeba, including your uh, entamoeba hartmani, entamoeba polecki, iodamoeba butchlai, and your endolimax nena. So it starts off with the ingestion of the infective stage, which is your cyst. The cyst passes through the acidic stomach and scathe, protected by the cyst walls. The existation occurs in the alkaline environment of your lower small intestines. The metacystic trophozoites will now colonize your large intestines and live on the mucous coat covering the intestinal mucosa. And since the amoeba are non-invasive, they do not cause disease. The reproduction is through your binary fission of the trophozoites and encystation will occur as the amoeba passes through the lower colon and the life cycle uh, repeats itself. So for the clinical picture of your entamoeba coli, they are mostly asymptomatic and prognosis is usually high. But for patients with symptoms, they present with nonspecific uh, stomach cramps, 
stomach tenderness, nausea, and vomiting. For the diagnosis, usually a stool examination is performed. Liquid stools will likely yield your trophozoites, while form stools will likely yield your cyst. A direct fecal smear will demonstrate your trophozoites, while your formalin ether concentration technique or your FECT will differentiate the species. For the treatment and management, supportive care should be provided for patients and proper hygiene should be maintained. So how do we distinguish your E. coli from your E. histolytica? For the trophozoites, uh, your, e, your Entamoeba coli trophozoite is usually more vacuolated. They have a granular endoplasmic reticulum with bacteria and debris, but no RBCs ingested. Um, unlike for your Entamoeba histolytica, usually RBCs are seen ingested inside the trophozoites. Um, the trophozoite of your E. coli is also narrower and has a less differentiated ectoplasm. They are usually broader and blunter uh, in terms of their pseudopodia, and they move more sluggishly with undirected movements, unlike for your E. histolytica, which have a directional purposeful motility. Um, they have a thicker irregular peripheral chromatin with large eccentric cardiosome in the nucleus, unlike your uh, Entamoeba histolytica, which has a characteristic centrally located or bullseye cardiosome uh, nucleus. Now for the cyst, the cyst of your Entamoeba coli is usually larger and they have a greater number of nuclei. Um, the general rule is if there's four or less um, nuclei, it's Entamoeba histolytica. If it's four or more, it's uh, Entamoeba coli. They, uh, the Entamoeba coli cysts also have a more granular cytoplasm and a splinter-like chromatoidal body. Unlike for your Entamoeba histolytica cysts, they usually have a rod-like uh, or sausage-like shape um, chromatoidal body. Good afternoon, Doc. Good afternoon, classmates. I am Jenny Abdullah, and I will be reporting about the two members of the sub-kingdom protozoa. But before that, let me give you a brief description about these two members. First is the Entamoeba gingivalis, which is one of the seven Entamoeba species that commonly infect humans, and it is usually found in the oropharynx, where it is considered a commensal organism. A gingivalis is more common in patients with poor dentation, periodontal disease, or immune suppression. Next is the endolimax mana, which is the smallest of the intestine-dwelling amoebae, infecting humans, its, uh, its trophozoid averaging only 8 micrometers in diameter. And the trophozoid lives in the host's colon and is generally considered to be non-pathogenic. And now, let's have a deeper discussion about these two members. For Entamoeba gingivalis, this is a commensal organism that inhabits the mouth. And as its name suggests, E. gingivalis are commonly found inhibiting the, inhabiting, inhabiting the gingival tissue surrounding the teeth and gums and rarely in tonsils. So there is no known cyst stage for this species. And the trophozoite measures 10 to 20 micrometers. Um, trophozoites possess a single nucleus that, contain, that contains a small centrally located karyosome and fine peripheral um, chromatin. The cytoplasm often contains ingested leukocytes, bacteria, and other debris, very rarely red blood cells. The trophozoites may also extend a granular pseudopodia, while the main cell cytoplasm remains granular in appearance. It moves quickly and has numerous bland pseudopodia. Food vacuoles that contain cellular debris mostly leukocytes, which is, which is a characteristic of this species, and bacteria are numerous. Uh, multiply in bronchial mucus and to appear in the sputum where it might be mistaken for E. histolytica from a pulmonary abscess. 
the trophozoite um, stage of E. gingivalis is morphologically similar to that of E. histolytica. The two should be differentiated as both can be cuffed up in sputum specimens, especially if E. histolytica is present in pulmonary abscess. So the mode of transmission for this um, for this and uh, for the intermeba gingivalis is the direct is direct contact through kissing, um, droplet, dro droplet spray or by sharing utensils. So the life cycle of entomoeba gingivalis is again it, uh, is a transmission between uh, person to person. So for the clinical disease, they are abundant in cases of oral disease. This amoebae are most frequently recovered from the mouths of patients suffering from pyorrhea alveolaris, although numerous um, attempts have have been made to implicate these organisms in the production of peri periodontal disease. It is it seems probable that they are most conspicuous under disease conditions simply because they find um, there are more suitable environment or because they are they find more suitable environment. In a survey made from gingival scrapings, amoebae of E. gingivalis were found in 59% of 113 dental patients and in 32% of 96 control subjects with good oral hygiene. So as this figure suggests, um, it uh, affected, uh, there is a low um, number of subjects which are affected um, with good oral hygiene, but uh, compared to those um, subjects that are, uh, that have poor oral hygiene. So in addition, E. gingivalis is a common, uh, is common in individuals with poor oral hygiene or periodontal disease. However, several studies have not definitely demonstrated any causative correlation. It appears that disease periodontal tissue, disease periodontal tissue, and associated actinomyces bacteria simply provide a favorable environment for the amoeba to develop. So, occasionally, E. gingivalis strophozoids have also been reported from the female genital tract, particularly in association with the use of intrauterine device. A few moments later. And for the laboratory diagnosis, for E. gingivalis, a swab between the gums and teeth is examined for trophozoids. Trophozoids may be seen ingesting white cells and epithelial cell, epithelial cell nuclei. So as you can see in this um picture the blue the first picture the blue one which is the trophozoid of e gingivalis stained with papan papa nicolaus or the pop stain and you're not gonna stop there and then no what are you waiting for do it this uh Just this um do it yes you dark, can just do uh, it! Structure here, which is pointed by the black arrow, is the uh, um, is is the white or ingested white cells and epithelial cell nuclei. Two genetic subtypes exist: the ST1 and the ST2 Kamakli subtype sub subtypes. Though any, though any clinical significance or morphologic differences between these two have not been investigated. E. gingivalis may be found in sputum or rare occasions 
uh, or detected in cervical pap smears. As such, it is important to differentiate them from the morphologically similar trophozoites uh, of E. histolytica, which may be found in sputum from pulmonary abscesses and invading the female genital tract. So the next picture below, you can see um, also this is a papanic Papa Nicolaus uh, pap stain. And again, um, this is a this is a uh, trophozoite of the Entamoeba gingivalis um, that uh, showing the extended pseudo pseudopod. And the pseudopod is the um, pointing by the black arrow. So riboprinting is a technique that compares ribosomal RNA gene sequences, has identified the organism as E. gingivalis and infection most likely followed orogenital contact. So for the um, treatment for this um, entamoeba gingivalis, no treatment is necessary because this amoebae amoebe do not cause disease. Prevention and control, um, contraction of the organism may be prevented through proper, proper disposal of human waste and, of course, a good personal hygiene. Now, let's um, go to our next species, which is the Endolimax nana. So for this one, um, Endolimax nana is the smallest of the intestinal dwelling amoebae, infecting um, humans. It's trophozoites averaging only 8 micrometer in diameter or ranges from 6 to 15 micrometer. The trophozoid lines or leaves, I'm sorry, it, um, the trophozoid lives in the host colon and is generally considered um, to be non-pathogenic. According to some survey, surveys, prevalence may be as high as 30% in some populations. So for the, and it is also, uh, it has also been found um, in the appendix aside from colon. The mode of transmission for this um, species is that fecal oral contamination of food or water cysts have been observed in drinking water from deep wells and on raw consumed vegetables. So for its main host, it, it is of course the human. And the, um, for its morphologic features, um, let's um, discuss first the trophozoite. Trophozoites are the small are small with a diameter of five to twelve micrometer, and they are the smallest amoeba and has nearly similar size with red red blood cells. They have blunt hyaline pseudopodia, movement. Um, non-directional and sluggish. Nucleus, vesicular, as you can see, and spherical, as you can see in the picture, measuring 2.0 to 2.5 micrometer and has a large irregular karyosome. The irregular karyosome, as you can see in this picture, is that um, the dark, dark part of, um, or the dark part of this um, structure. It's the karyosome. So for the morphologic features, um, now uh, let's go to its um, the uh, cyst, of course, usually measure five to uh, five to ten micrometer, with a normal range of six to eight micrometer, and is usually oval, as you can see on the picture, oval to round, quadrinucleated when mature, resembling a cross-eyed appearance. Look like with large, usually centrally located karyosomes and no peripheral chromatin. Very small, slightly curved chromatoidal bars and are occasionally present. For the life cycle, now let's discuss the life cycle of and the uh, limax nana. 
for its life cycle. Generally, um, Entamoeba coli, Entamoeba hartmani, as you can see, Entamoeba polecki, and, and Iodamoeba butch, butch, uh, butchli. And uh, of course, our um, uh, Endolimax nana. Uh, this uh, all have a similar life cycle and are generally considered non-pathogenic and resides in the um, large intestine of the human hosts. So first, um, both cysts, as you can see, both, both cysts and trophozoids uh, of this species uh, are, pre are, are passed in stool and considered diagnostic. So from, from the... Um, from the stool or feces, this cyst or trophozoite will pass. Um, as you can see on the picture, this number one cyst and trophozoites pass in feces. It is already diagnostic by this time. And cysts are typically seen or found in form stools, while the trophozoites are typically found in diarrheal stools. So as we go, um, the, for the second stage of its life cycle, um, colonization of the non-pathogenic amoeba. Am amoeba occurs after ingestion of mature cyst in fecal, uh, fecally contaminated food, water, or fomites. So as you can see, mature cyst ingested, it is already, again, diagnostic and infective stage. It, uh, when it is, uh, or when uh, the food or water um, was ingested to uh, by a host, Okay, it will now go to our third stage, which is the existation, or uh, yes, it's existation occurs, number three, as you can see, uh, in the small intestine. Existation occurs in the small intestine, and then the trophozoites are released. These trophozoites will migrate to the large intestine and... After that, um, in addition, the trophozoites will multiply by uh, binary fission and produce cysts and produce cysts, and both this uh, both stages are passed in the feces. So again, it will go back to our um, to our stage or first stage of the life cycle. It will just repeat from stage one, two, and three from, again, existation in the small intestine, and then uh, trophozoites will, uh, will be released, and then, and then the um, trophozoite will migrate to the large intestine and then uh, go back to its uh, first or first stage of life cycle. It will go, it will be... Um, passed by the stool or feces. So that's the life cycle. Next, epidemiology. Those are found worldwide. Prevalence is highest in areas with adequate sanitation. Um, precise estimate of the prevalence of endolimax nana is a challenge due to the limited amount of data and is considered unimportant in relation to aim of studies leading to an underestimation of the prevalence of inana. The global prevalence of inana is in healthy individuals is estimated to be 13.9% on average. Apparently, most carriers of inana are found in Africa and South America. Relatively low prevalence is generally observed in studies from Asia. So for the clinical significance of this species, is that endolimax is considered a non-pathogenic um, non uh, commensal protozoan par uh, paras parasiting the human colon. 
So the evidence supporting endolimax as a non-pathogenesis is, is, is still is scarce. But one study, which is entitled the Systemic Review of Endolimax Nana, a less well-studied intestinal amoeba, wherein the author infected himself by this uh, species and did not experience any symptoms. And he also performed um, post-mortem examination in infected monkeys and failed to discover any amoebic lesions in the intestine. So for, uh, it is common to find reports on association between um, diarrhea and endolimax infections. This association may at least in the part B, uh, in part B, um, this association may at least in part be explained by endolimax being an indicator of fecal contamination, which may often entail co-infection by the organisms capable of causing diarrhea, which is um, here a co-infection with blastocytes, for example. And for diagnosis, diagnosis for this um, species is that stool examination, morphologic examination, um, formalin-based concentrated test, next is wet mounts, then permanent stained smears, which is xyl nielsen stain, trichome stain, or iodine stain. For its treatment, again, there's no treatment um, necessary because this amoeba is, again, do, uh, do not cause disease. And prevention and control, again, is that um, depend on improvement or improve personal hygiene on overall upgrading of sanitary conditions and waste disposal and, of course, adequate washing of contaminated fruits and vegetables. So that's it for our and the lime. Let's give it. No uh, let's give the floor to our to next stop. reporter. Thank you. And now we're going to proceed with another species under the Sarcodina subphylum, the Iodamoeba bushli. This is another member of the amoeba family. However, Iodamoeba bushli is considered as a non-pathogenic species. Good to note that the term Iodamoeba was coined to describe an amoeba that stains well with iodine. The trophocyte of this species usually averages from 9 to 14 micrometer long and it has a characteristic large vesicular nucleus with large endosome surrounded by achromatic granules. Iodamibo butchlai does not contain peripheral chromatin granules on nucle nuclear membrane. For its cis form, it is a nucleated with large glycogen body which stains deeply with iodine. Both trophozoite and cis forms contain only one nucleus. As we have mentioned a while ago, Iodamibo bushli is considered to be non-pathogenic. Therefore, it does not necessitate any treatment. It has a wide geographical distribution and has a higher pre prevalence in trop tropical regions. Its reservoir hosts are pigs and contaminated <laughs> outfaces have been implicated as the source of some infections. It is transmitted when infected seeds are ingested in contaminated food or drink. Hand-to-mouth transmission may also occur. It has been epidemiologically studied that, that a prevalence of 9% was seen in single stool examinations of over 30,000 Filipinos. Contraction of this organism may be prevented through proper risk disposal and good personal hygiene. For its life cycle, both its trophozoite and cyst forms can be passed through feces and may serve as the diagnostic stage of the amoeba iodamoeba bushlight. Upon entering the environment, it will transform into a mature cyst. Subsequently, the mature cyst or the infective stage may be ingested from contaminated food or drink as we have mentioned a while ago. 
A panic gesture and consistation of the mature cyst will happen in the small intestine. Ultimately, the non-invasive colonization will ensue in the large intestine of the infected host, and the cycle continues. As a general rule, its trapezoid form is found in watery stools while its cyst form is found in formed solid stools. Direct fecal smear is used to demonstrate trophocytes. In addition, formalin ether or ethyl acetate concentration technique and iodine stain are both useful to differentiate the species. Iodamoeba butchlai is a non-pathogenic amoeba. Iron hematoxylin or trichrom stain preparation is utilized for its definitive diagnosis. The trophocyte form is noted to mimic endolimox nina in an unstained preparation. Trophocyte form thrives in the large intestine by, by ingesting bacteria and yeast, but not red blood cells, thereby demonstrating the presence of bacteria in its cytoplasm under the mi microscope. Iodamiba bushlai presents with sluggishly progressive motility in freshly prepared specimens. Using hematoxylin and trichrome stain, trophocytes may vary from 4 to 20 microns diameter, but majority is within the 9 to 14 microns. Nucleus again is not usually visible. The cis form has an average diameter range of 9 to 10 microns. The matured form contains only one nucleus. When unstained, the cyst is surrounded by a refractile wall and has an irregular shape and a glycogen vacuole that is still predominant. Again, the nucleus is seldom listed. In permanently stained preparation, chromatin granules may form a crescent shape partially surrounding the cardiosome. Lean fibrils may be seen running between the cardiosome and the chromatin granules. The nucleus of Iodamoeba butchlai cyst is often described as resembling a basket of flowers in shape. As we can see in the four images, the upper left shows iodine stained cyst of Iodamoeba butchlai. The remaining three images demonstrate iron hematoxylin stained cyst of the species. Glycogen granules are also demonstrated as the pale staining portion of the in the cytoplasm of the cyst. In this table, it is noted that the presence of trophocyte and cyst forms in a stained preparation are diagnostic for Iodamoeba bushlai. Included in the description beside are the characteristics discussed a while ago. The unstained trophocyte shows no characteristic while the unstained cyst may only be sub suggestive for the presence of Iodamoeba bushlai. For the final species, <laughs> it's, it's time to stop! No, this is, this is not okay! It's time to stop! It's time to stop! <sighs> I'm sorry, Bob. It may not be a part of the Sarcodina subphylum, but the Antomibo fragilis shares some similar characteristics with the previously discussed species of amoeba. The Antomibo fragilis was originally, originally described as an amoeba, but actually it is a flagellate with only the trophocyte stage known. It measures 7 to 12 microns with one or two rosette shaped nuclei. Although classified under the flagellates, this species has pseudopodia that are hyaline, broad, and leaf-like in appearance with serrated markings. Its nuclear membrane does not have peripheral chromatin, and the chorosome consists of four to six discrete granules. It has no known cyst stage, and it thrives in the mucosal crypts of large intestine, particularly in appendix, secum, and upper colon. The entomoeba fragilis is transmitted via fecal oral route or, though non-conclusive, via transmission of helminth eggs 
particularly that of Enterobius vermicularis. Several studies have found that a notable frequency of organisms resembling the antamibofragilis were identified in patients who were also infected with enter Enterobius vermicularis. The presence of the antamibofragilis in the intestines produces irritation of the mucosa with secretion of excess mucus and hypermotility of the bowel, although tissue invasion is absent. As a result, chronic infection is manif manifested by symptoms that mimic diarrhea-predominant irritable bowel syndrome. Diagnosis of infection includes observation of binucleate trophocytes in multiple fixed and stained fresh stool samples or what we call the purge stool specimens. From fixation of the fresh specimen with polyvinyl alcohol fixative or Schaudin's fixative has been found to be helpful. Good to note also, the antamibofragilis differs from the amoebic trophocytes when mounted in water prefer preparations. Although both types of organisms swell and rupture under these conditions, only the antamibofragilis return to its normal size. Numerous granules are present in this stage and exhibit brownian, brownian motion. This is known as the Hackinson phenomenon. It is a feature diagnostic for the antamibofragilis identification. For its life cycle, as mentioned earlier, its diagnostic stage is the trophocyte form present in liquid stool. We also mentioned earlier that it has no cyst stage. So the infect infective stage is also the trophocyte form. We can also see in the diagram that the trophocyte can be passed via the helminth eggs, particularly that of Enterobius vermicularis and Ascaris lumbricoides. Transmission occurs via fecal oral route. Inside the host, it undergoes binary fission in the lumen of the colon. Then, the cycle continues. The antimibofragilis infection is treated with 650 mg of iodokinol 3 times daily for 20 days. The pediatric dose is 40 mg per kilogram per day in 3 doses, also for 20 days. <coughs> Tetracycline and metro metronidazole have been also found to be effective. Its infection rate ranges from 0.4 to as high as 42%. High prevalence rate also are reported from de developed countries with high sanitation standards. Ultimately, proper sanitation and disposal of human waste are essential. That ends our presentation. Thank you for listening and have a good day.